I've been working in construction for decades. I've worked with hundreds of men and dozens of foremen before I became a general contractor. And I would just like to go through some of the things I've learned from some of the foremen so that when you get the responsibility or opportunity to be a job foreman, you might have some things to think about that have not occurred to you yet. The first job I worked on was right here in Roseburg, Oregon, and I was 18, and the boss was Art. He was tall, I bet he was 6'4", and I bet he weighed a buck 90, and he was in his mid-40s, and he had a fuse about that long and a terrible temper. So I learned the, uh, I learned the way people respond to you when you're big and you're strong and you've got a temper. And I've all, I also learned from Art that even though he was kind of a rough guy, he understood math. I recognized right away because I had just come out of, you know, a high school environment where I had taken, you know, some trigonometry and the beginning sort of lead up classes to calculus and I thought I was familiar with math and I recognized art understands numbers and he puts them to work every darn day and he doesn't mind showing some of the rest of us how those numbers can help him and us do our job. So thank you art. You taught me I don't have to be afraid of a man just because he has a temper, and you taught me that numbers are important if you want to be a foreman on a construction site. In 1981, just after I had this job working under Art, and with Steve Hood, who was the number two man and was the opposite of Art in terms of temper, Steve and I have remained friends ever since, but the economy here tanked. Their unemployment was 23%, and I moved to Wyoming because I had to keep working, because by then I had a family and Kelly and I moved into the Rocky Mountains. When we got to Wyoming, by the third day I was there, I had a job. I was working for a guy named Bob, who was, he had been a school teacher and he was no longer a school teacher, he was making better money as a general contractor. And I think it was his brother-in-law who was a lead man. And Dan had the advantage of being related to the boss. And Dan also had good carpenter skills. He was so good, in fact, that he was probably half as good as he thought he was which was okay because I was only a quarter as good as I thought I was. But the thing that I learned from Dan was, if you get your ego pushed too far out in front of you, don't be surprised if the guys you're working for resent it and their productivity drops off and there comes a mediocrity just because the man in charge has to convince you all the time that he's the man in charge. So I learned that from Dan. So thank you, Dan, and probably you've grown up as much as I have. After about three months of working there for the school teacher and his brother-in-law, I went to work for Wade Welch. Wade Welch was a solo flyer. He had had one or two guys. He hired me. I ended up kind of as his lead man, but Wade would come back after he, after he ran the errands that the owner had to run. He would come back and put his bags on, and he schooled me. He was not afraid to teach me, and he was not afraid to subtly encourage me with gentle teasing about doing a little better, doing a little more, keeping your eyes open, open, and sort of measuring up to the high bar that he had established. I loved Wade. I was happy to work for him, and he taught me perhaps more than any one person about carpentry. Wade is dead now. He ended up moving to Detroit because the Wyoming economy tanked, and so I learned a couple of things from Wade. I learned that even a qualified man sometimes has to move for work, I learned that the best way to teach a young man who wants to learn is by encouraging, teasing a little bit, and holding out as a carrot and a goal, see if you can do this as good as I can. Thanks, Wade. I moved to Las Vegas. It was exhilarating, it was intimidating, it was instantly doubling my salary. I left, I left Wyoming making 10 bucks, and I ended up on the ground in, in Las Vegas making 20 bucks. It made it possible for Kelly to stay home and be a stay-at-home mom and raise our children while I made decent money in Las Vegas. And one of the first foremen that I remember working for, I went to work on a, a steel structure that had a wood envelope that ended up receiving glass. It was a five-story office building with glass, but it was wood partitions and suspended concrete slabs, and boy, did I have a lot to learn. And I began to work with some guys who had some production framing experience and they had a, a foreman who was brought in because he had been a production framer in the tract, and his name was Tim. And he was big, he was a little soft, but he was good-natured, and he knew the moves. And he had kind of a jocularity, right? He had kind of a, 
He was a bit of a jokester. And that was pretty good because he also had expectations. But one particular day, I think I was using a Hilti gun to shoot some hardened pins through a green Douglas fir two by six into the bottom flange of a piece of an I-beam. If you held it really hard, it would shoot through. And it, it probably wasn't the best way to fasten, but it was what we were doing. And somehow or another, I held the board up and I pinned it and I thought it was held and I went down, it was probably a 10 or 12 foot two by six, 12 feet in the air. And I shot the other end and the first pin dropped loose and it dropped to the ground and the foreman was standing there and that board hit him on the head. And he was not wearing a hard hat and it hurt. I mean, it hurt. And the thing I learned from Tim in that moment was he maintained his composure. He was hurt. He shook it off. He didn't blame me. And he kept moving and so did I. And so I learned that sometimes the foreman's got to be just a little tougher than you might have to be if you were just one of the guys and you could go shake it off and sit down on a sawhorse and hang your head and mope a little bit. Tim sucked it up. And I recognized right then that there was some value in being able to take a shot and keep doing your job when you're the leader of the band. I worked for that outfit, Martin Harris Construction, for, I don't know, two or three years. And then I left those guys and I did some other things. I did some production framing and then I went to work for MS Concrete. They were starting up a little commercial, a more commercial industrial aspect to what they had been doing in a big way in residential and curb and gutter and offsite work. And somewhere in there, we started doing tilt ups and uh, did a little bridge and libraries and churches and strip malls. And they were getting big in that they were, they were going into that in a big way and they were trying to hire qualified people and they hired a guy named Cleve and they gave, put him in charge of the Summerlin Library. And I was running work somewhere else and I was figuring out some, they had me figuring out some kind of non-typical stuff. I had a bit of a reputation then for being able to do that. And so they sent me over to help Cleve, but he was the lead man. And I was just running, setting up some serpentine, various heights, snap tie, 12, 14 foot high walls, and they were tricky. And I was watching Cleve because he was, big and he was in he was kind of brash and kind of intimidating and he was a former wrestler and he wasn't the kind of guy you wanted to mess with and boy was he confident and he was so confident that he just didn't care really about sort of putting his best foot forward with the owners and the boss and the superintendent he was just by golly going to crack the whip and do the job and he did he did he had a good leadership style with his guys I get along with him well. And uh, problem was, Cleve didn't spend any time taking care of the company truck that they'd given. It wasn't the newest truck. It was kind of a hand-me-down. I think I had a newer truck. I don't remember. But not only did he not take care of it, but he kind of thrashed it. And it was just, there came a day when that job wound down and it was done that the superintendent came over and said, look, if you're not going to take care of my gear any better than that, we don't need you. They fired him even though he was a qualified, a qualified foreman with lots of concrete knowledge and he could get good work out of his hands, I realized right then, whoa, I better pay just a little more attention to taking care of what's entrusted to me as a foreman, maybe like I own it. And I had kind of been doing that anyway, but it just helped me understand that even a qualified guy who's doing his job in a lot of ways can cut off his nose to spite his face if he doesn't cross the important T's and dot the important I's. The last example was the foreman that I worked for when I was still working for MS Concrete that made, has been in my mind and in my memory the best example of a lead man. It was Drew Jolly. When I went to work for them, he still had his bags on occasionally. And by the time I was done, the effort that he was leading had gotten big enough that he just drove around in the truck and coordinated the jobs and made sure everything was staged and on hand and on site. And Drew kind of checked all the boxes that I had in my mind of what a good job foreman ought to be. He could bark at you if he needed to bark. He could figure out the things he needed to figure out. He didn't hide the plans from the people that were working with him. He would in fact roll the plans out and say, hey, you guys come over here and look, here's what we're doing. Some people protect the plans like they're protecting their position. Don't do that. He was not afraid to hire and recognize people who, were, who had skills he didn't have. 
he would, actually, he would actively find out what other people were good at and then use them in the areas where they had more mastery of the skill set than he did. He was not threatened by, other, by the places where other people were ahead of him. There was just something about Drew Jolly that made it easy to follow him, easy to, to um, be on board with whatever his program was, and easy to respect him on and off the job. I identified Drew as sort of a role model as a foreman. And when I left there, and in the other places where I have run work, I realized that the most effective way to be a foreman is, at least as a carpenter and on commercial jobs, keep your bags on. Don't be in a hurry to take those off and set yourself apart as management. Look for an opportunity to labor. If you can replace a quarter or a third or a half of a laborer's effort, along with a quarter or a half of a carpenter's effort, you can cycle through the job as you stock and as you jump in with a shovel and as you participate in the work and cycle from workstation to workstation, not just to be critical and find a mistake, but to be a participant and relieve someone else of some portion of what they're falling behind at. You're gonna earn respect. You're going to earn your check in two or three ways. And if you don't fall into the trap of keeping your head down and getting absorbed in a task so you're not providing management, you can set your part of yourself apart as someone who's interested in really earning the additional money that you make often if you receive a foreman's responsibility. So I don't know if any of this is helpful. I enjoyed my time working under good foreman. I chafed during the time when I was working under people who didn't know how to use authority properly. And I was grateful for what I learned from all those guys when I finally had a chance to sort of step up and take a little leadership role on a job site. And I will always look back with particular appreciation on Drew Jolly and the things I learned from him. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.